Cormilda College. Section A. Cormilda College is a unique school situated near Darwin in Australia's Northern Territory. For 20 years, to 1989, Cormilda College operated as a government-run, live-in school for high school Aboriginal students. In 1989 it was bought from the government by two Christian church groups and since then it has expanded enormously, to include a day school as well as boarders, residential students, in years 8 to 12. Although 320 pupils of the college's total number are Aboriginal students, drawn mainly from isolated communities across the Northern Territory, Cormilda also has a waiting list of non-Aboriginal students. With a current enrollment of 600, student numbers are expected to grow to 860 by 1999. Section B. Central to the mission of the school is the encouragement of individual excellence, which has resulted in programs designed especially for the student population. Specialist support programs allow traditional Aboriginal students, who are often second language users, to understand and succeed in the mainstream curriculum. A gifted and talented program, including a special Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tertiary aspirations program, has been introduced, as has an adaptive education unit. Moreover, in years 11 and 12, students may choose to follow the standard Northern Territory courses, or those of the International Baccalaureate, IB. Section C to provide appropriate pastoral care, as well as a suitable academic structure, three distinct subschools have been established. Pre-secondary, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students in years 8 to 10 who are of secondary school age but have difficulties reading and writing. Supported secondary, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students who are of secondary school age and operating at secondary school year levels 8 to 12 who need specific second language literacy and numeracy support. Secondary, for multicultural years 8 to 12 students. Students remain in their subschools for classes in the main subject areas of English, Maths, Social Education, and Science. This arrangement takes into account both diverse levels of literacy and the styles of learning and cultural understandings appropriate to traditional Aboriginal second language users. In elective subjects chosen by the students, which include Indonesian, music, art, drama, science for life, commerce, geography, modern history, woodwork, metalwork, economics and legal studies, students mix on the basis of subject interest. In the class Reptilia or Reptiles, one of the five main classes of vertebrata, animals with backbones. However, at the next level of classification, within reptiles, significant differences in the skeletal anatomy of lizards and dinosaurs have led scientists to place these groups of animals into two different superorders, Lepidosauria or Lepidosaurs, and Archosaur or Archosaurs. B. Classified as Lepidosaurs are lizards and snakes and their prehistoric ancestors. Included among the Archosaurs or ruling reptiles are prehistoric and modern crocodiles, and the now extinct Thecodonts, pterosaurs, and dinosaurs. Paleontologists believe that both dinosaurs and crocodiles evolved in the later years of the Triassic period, c. 248 208 million years ago, from creatures called Pseudosuchian thecodonts. Lizards, snakes and different types of thecodont are believed to have evolved earlier in the Triassic period from reptiles known as Eosuchians. c. The most important skeletal differences between dinosaurs and other archosaurs are in the bones of the skull, pelvis, and limbs. Dinosaur skulls are found in a great range of shapes and sizes, reflecting the different eating habits and lifestyles of a large and varied group of animals that dominated life on Earth for an extraordinary 165 million years. However, unlike the skulls of any other known animals, the skulls of dinosaurs had two long bones known as vomers. These bones extended on either side of the head, from the front of the snout to the level of the holes in the skull known as the antorbital fenestra, situated in front of the dinosaur's orbits, or eye sockets. d. All dinosaurs, whether large or small, quadrupedal or bipedal, fleet-footed or slow-moving, shared a common body plan. Identification of this plan makes it possible to differentiate dinosaurs from any other types of animal, even other archosaurs. Most significantly, in dinosaurs, the pelvis and femur had evolved so that the hind limbs were held vertically beneath the body, rather than sprawling out to the sides like the limbs of a lizard. The femur of a dinosaur had a sharply interned neck and a ball-shaped head, which slotted into a fully open acetabulum or hip socket. A superacetabular crest helped prevent dislocation of the femur. The position of the knee joint, aligned below the acetabulum, made it possible for the whole hind limb to swing backwards and forwards. 
This unique combination of features gave dinosaurs what is known as a fully improved gait. Evolution of this highly efficient method of walking also developed in mammals, but among reptiles it occurred only in dinosaurs. E. For the purpose of further classification, dinosaurs are divided into two orders, Sarischia or Sarischian dinosaurs, and Ornithischia or Ornithischian dinosaurs. This division is made on the basis of their pelvic anatomy. All dinosaurs had a pelvic girdle with each side comprised of three bones, the pubis, ilium, and ischium. However, the orientation of these bones follows one or two patterns. In Sarischian dinosaurs, also known as lizard-hipped dinosaurs, the pubis points forwards, as is usual in most types of reptile. By contrast, in Ornithischian or bird-hipped dinosaurs, the pubis points backwards towards the rear of the animal, which is also true of birds. F. Of the two orders of dinosaurs, the Sarischia was the large and the first to evolve. It is divided into two suborders, Therapoda or Theropods, and Sauropodomorpha or Sauropodomorphs. The theropods or beast feet were bipedal, predatory carnivores. They ranged in size from the mighty Tyrannosaurus rex, 12 m long, 5.6 m tall and weighing an estimated 6.4 tons, to the smallest known dinosaur, Compsognathus, merely 1.4 m long and estimated 3 kg in weight when fully grown. The sauropodomorphs or lizard feet forms included both bipedal and quadrupedal dinosaurs. Some sauropodomorphs were carnivorous or omnivorous, but later species were typically herbivorous. They included some of the largest and best known of all dinosaurs, such as Diplodocus, a huge quadruped with an elephant-like body, a long, thin tail and neck that gave it a total length of 27 m and a tiny head. G. Ornithischian dinosaurs were bipedal or quadrupedal herbivores. They are now usually divided into three suborders, Ornithopoda, Thyreophora, and Marginocephalia. The ornithopods or bird feet, both large and small, could walk or run on their long hind legs, balancing their body by holding their tails stiffly off the ground behind them. An example is Iguanodon, up to 9 m long, 5 m tall, and weighing 4.5 tons. The Thyreophorans or shield bearers, also known as armored dinosaurs, were quadrupeds with rows of protective bony spikes, studs, or plates along their backs and tails. They included Stegosaurus, 9 m long and weighing 2 tons. H. The Marginocephalians or margined heads were bipedal or quadrupedal ornithischians with a deep bony frill or narrow shelf at the back of the skull. An example is Triceratops, a rhinoceros-like dinosaur, 9 m long, weighing 5.4 tons and bearing a prominent neck frill and three large horns. The Life of an Amma Life in China at the beginning of the 20th century was a very different world than today, especially for women. It was often a very hard life with most women working in the rural areas of China for nothing more than a hand-to-mouth living. For many women in Guangdong province by the Pearl River Delta, however, life was to change forever. The villages they lived in by the Delta that had once been surrounded by fish ponds were now replaced by mulberry trees. This meant large quantities of white mulberry leaves to feed silkworms. This was a chance for many women in the area to grab their independence and they did this by working in China's now booming silk industry. It is estimated that over 2 million women were involved in the silk industry. They took great pride in their independence and refused a conventional lifestyle. They formed sisterhoods and refused to get married, swore oaths of chastity and moved out of their family homes into spinster houses or vegetarian halls as they were called. Some women even held funeral services for a sister who had decided to marry. By the 1930s, however, it was all over. The silk industry had been badly affected by the World Depression and many of the once thriving factories were forced to close leaving many women jobless. Some managed to maintain their independence by becoming domestic servants. These were the Amas. By moving to Hong Kong, Singapore and other Southeast Asian countries they could earn enough money, $5 a month, to live a reasonable life and continue their independent lifestyle. An Amas social life took place in a coolie fong. This was a two-three-story building rented by a sisterhood. It was here where she would spend time after her working day was over or on days off. It was a place to relax, share stories with other sisters, hear about new job opportunities, and collect any letters that had been sent to her from her family in China. 
Sisterhoods usually ranged in size from 6 to 10 women but could have up to 30 members. The sisterhood networks helped women migrate from the silk areas of China into cities overseas. Once the sisters had arrived in one of these cities, the sisterhoods trained the women in various skills to be a cook, lady's maid, or baby ama, and assisted them in finding jobs and in relocating them and their work situation was unsatisfactory. The training provided by the sisterhood usually helped the sister become a valued servant and, therefore, to receive the wages she asked for. In many ways the sisterhood was similar to a primitive labor union in that members established job definitions and minimum wages for each job. If a member was treated badly by an employer, other sisters refused to work for the employer. Sometimes one sisterhood dominated the domestic staff of a whole apartment building. In such cases, the sisterhood controlled who was hired, and if an employer fired a sister without just cause, the sisterhood made it very difficult for the employer to hire another servant. Sisterhoods also established loan associations for their members, which were especially important for immigrants separated from possible family assistance. The loan associations also acted as investment clubs where the women pooled their savings to buy property where they could retire together. Every ama had a different routine as this partly depended on the size of the family they were working for and whether they were European or local. Europeans tended to be more demanding. Some households would hire more than one ama but others would only hire one. For many amas this was a good thing. Although they had to work harder they felt they were more independent and free of typical domestic servant arguments. These amas were usually known as one leg kick or yet kiak tek in Cantonese, since they did all the work in the household. A typical workday began when she woke up early in the morning around 5 a.m. and after getting herself ready, she would start cooking breakfast. After doing the dishes, she swept and tidied up the house. When that was done, she washed the clothes and prepared lunch. After cleaning up, she did the ironing. When that was done, she took a bath. It would then be time to cook again. By the time dinner was over and she had cleaned up and finished the dishes, it would be about 9 p.m. A 16-hour day that was repeated seven days a week with only an occasional half day off. Sometimes known as black and whites because they often wore white shirts and black pants with their hair in a bun or a long braid falling down their backs, they were seen as an elite group of servants that were hardworking, trustworthy, and completely loyal to the families they worked for. Stories of their complete loyalty are common with one Amma jumping into the sea to rescue her English charge who had accidentally fallen from the ship. Others even worked for free if their employees lost their job and couldn't pay them. In return the Ammas were not exploited but treated like members of the family. Indeed, it was their loyalty that led to them being called Amma as the Cantonese word for mother is Amma. impact of climate change. A. Tim Sparks slides a small leather-bound notebook out of an envelope. The book's yellowing pages contain beekeeping notes made between 1941 and 1969 by the late Walter Coates of Kilworth, Leicestershire. He adds it to his growing pile of local journals, birdwatchers' lists, and gardening diaries. We're uncovering about one major new record each month, he says, I still get surprised. Around two centuries before Coates, Robert Marsham, a landowner from Norfolk in the east of England, began recording the life cycles of plants and animals on his estate when the first wood anemones flowered, the dates on which the oaks burst into leaf and the rooks began nesting. Successive Marshams continued compiling these notes for 211 years. B. Today, such records are being put to uses that their authors could not possibly have expected. These datasets, and others like them, are proving invaluable to ecologists interested in the timing of biological events, or phenology. By combining the records with climate data, researchers can reveal how, for example, changes in temperature affect the arrival of spring, allowing ecologists to make improved predictions about the impact of climate change. A small band of researchers is combing through hundreds of years of records taken by thousands of amateur naturalists. And more systematic projects have also started up, producing an overwhelming response. The amount of interest is almost frightening, says Sparks, a climate researcher at the Center for Ecology and Hydrology in Monks Wood, Cambridgeshire. C. Sparks first became aware of the army of closet phenologists, 
as he describes them, when a retiring colleague gave him the Marsham records. He now spends much of his time following leads from one historical data set to another. As news of his quest spreads, people tip him off to other historical records, and more amateur phonologists come out of their closets. The British devotion to recording and collecting makes his job easier. One man from Kent sent him 30 years' worth of kitchen calendars, on which he had noted the date that his neighbor's magnolia tree flowered. D. Other researchers have unearthed data from equally odd sources. Rafe Sagarin, an ecologist at Stanford University in California, recently studied records of a betting contest in which participants attempt to guess the exact time at which a specially erected wooden tripod will fall through the surface of a thawing river. The competition has taken place annually on the Tenana River in Alaska since 1917, and analysis of the results showed that the thaw now arrives five days earlier than it did when the contest began. E. Overall, such records have helped to show that, compared with 20 years ago, a raft of natural events now occur earlier across much of the northern hemisphere, from the opening of leaves to the return of birds from migration and the emergence of butterflies from hibernation. The data can also hint at how nature will change in the future. Together with models of climate change, amateurs' records could help guide conservation. Terry Root, an ecologist at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, has collected birdwatchers' counts of wildfowl taken between 1955 and 1996 on seasonal ponds in the American Midwest and combined them with climate data and models of future warming. Her analysis shows that the increased droughts that the models predict could have the breeding populations at the ponds. The number of waterfowl in North America will most probably drop significantly with global warming. She says, F but not all professionals are happy to use amateur data. A lot of scientists won't touch them, they say they're too full of problems, says Root. Because different observers can have different ideas of what constitutes, for example, an open snowdrop. The biggest concern with ad hoc observations is how carefully and systematically they were taken, says Mark Schwartz of the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, who studies the interactions between plants and climate. We need to know pretty precisely what a person's been observing if they just say I noted when the leaves came out, it might not be that useful. Measuring the onset of autumn can be particularly problematic because deciding when leaves change color is a more subjective process than nothing when they appear. G. Overall, most phenologists are positive about the contribution that amateurs can make. They get at the raw power of science, careful observation of the natural world, says Sagarin. But the professionals also acknowledge the need for careful quality control. Root, for example, tries to gauge the quality of an amateur archive by interviewing its collector you always have to worry equals things as trivial as vacations can affect measurement. I disregard a lot of records because they're not rigorous enough, she says. Others suggest that the right statistics can iron out some of the problems with amateur data. Together with colleagues at Wageningen University in the Netherlands, environmental scientist Arnold van Vliet is developing statistical techniques to account for the uncertainty in amateur phenological data. With the enthusiasm of amateur phenologists evident from past records, professional researchers are now trying to create standardized recording schemes for future efforts. They hope that well-designed studies will generate a volume of observations large enough to drown out the idiosyncrasies of individual recorders. The data are cheap to collect and can provide breadth in space, time, and range of species. It's very difficult to collect data on a large geographical scale without enlisting an army of observers, says Root. H. Phenology also helps to drive home messages about climate change. Because the public understand these records, they accept them, says Sparks. It can also illustrate potentially unpleasant consequences, he adds, such as the finding that more rat infestations are reported to local councils in warmer years and getting people involved is great for public relations. People are thrilled to think that the data they've been collecting as a hobby can be used for something scientific if empowers them, says Root.
Its goal is to maximize a company's sales and profitability. Successful fashion marketing depends on understanding consumer wishes and responding with appropriate products. Marketers use sales tracking data, attention to media coverage, focus groups and other means of determining consumer preferences. They then provide feedback to designers and manufacturers about the type and quantity of goods to be produced. Marketers are thus responsible for identifying and defining a fashion producer's target customers and for responding to the preferences of those customers. B. Marketing operates at both the wholesale and retail levels. Businesses that do not sell their own products to customers must place those products at wholesale prices in the hands of retailers, such as boutiques, department stores, and online sales companies. They use fashion shows, catalogs, and a sales force armed with sample products to find a close fit between their products and the retailer's customers. Marketers for companies that do sell their own products at retail are primarily concerned with matching products to their own customer base. At both the wholesale and the retail level, marketing also involves promotional activities, such as advertising. This is aimed at establishing brand recognition and brand reputation for a range of characteristics such as quality, low price, or trendiness. C. Closely related to marketing is merchandising, which attempts to maximize sales and profitability by persuading consumers to buy a company's products. In the standard definition of the term, merchandising involves selling the right product, at the right price, at the right time and place, to the right customers, so fashion merchandisers must utilize marketers' information about customer preferences as the basis for decisions about such things as stocking appropriate merchandise in adequate but not excessive quantities, offering items for sale at attractive but still profitable prices, and discounting overstocked goods. Merchandising also involves presenting goods attractively and accessibly through the use of store windows, in-store displays, and special promotional events. Merchandising specialists must be able to respond to surges in demand by rapidly acquiring new stocks of the favored product. An inventory tracking software program in a department store in London, for instance, can trigger an automatic order to a production facility in Shanghai for a certain quantity of garments of a specified type and size to be delivered in a matter of days. D. By the early 21st century, the Internet had become an increasingly important retail outlet, creating new challenges, e.g., the inability for customers to try on clothes prior to purchase, the need for facilities designed to handle clothing returns and exchanges, and opening up new opportunities for merchandisers, e.g., the ability to provide customers with shopping opportunities 24 hours per day, affording access to rural customers. In an era of increasingly diverse shopping options for retail customers and of intense price competition among retailers, merchandising through the web has emerged as one of the most important functions of the modern fashion industry. E. Fashion designers and manufacturers promote their clothes not only to retailers, but also to the media and directly to customers. Already in the late 19th century, Paris couture houses began to offer their clients private viewings of the latest fashions. By the early 20th century, not only couture houses but also department stores regularly put on fashion shows with professional models. In imitation of Parisian couturiers, ready-to-wear designers in other countries also began mounting fashion shows for a mixed audience. In the late 20th and early 21st centuries, fashion shows became more elaborate and theatrical, were held in larger venues with specially constructed elevated runways, catwalks, for the models, and played an increasingly prominent role in the presentation of new fashions. F. By the early 21st century, fashion shows were a regular part of the fashion calendar. The couture shows, held twice a year in Paris, in January and July, by the official association of couture designers, comprising the most exclusive and expensive fashion houses, present outfits that might be ordered by potential clients, but which often are intended more to showcase the designers' concepts of fashion trends and brand image. Ready-to-wear fashion show, separately presenting both women's and men's wear, are held during spring and fall fashion weeks, of which the most important take place in Paris, Milan, New York, and London. However, there are literally dozens of other fashion weeks internationally, from Tokyo to Sao Paulo. These shows, of much greater commercial importance than the couture shows, are aimed primarily at fashion journalists and at buyers for department stores, wholesalers, and other major markets. Extensively covered in the media, fashion shows both reflect and advance the direction of fashion change. Photographs and videos of fashion shows are instantaneously transmitted to mass market producers, who then produce inexpensive clothing copied from or inspired by the runway designs. The Birdman
Will people finally be able to fly long distances without a plane? John Andres investigates. People have dreamt of flying since written history began. In the 1400s Leonardo da Vinci drew detailed plans for human flying machines. You might have thought the invention of mechanized flight would have put an end to such ideas. Far from it. For many enthusiasts, the ultimate flight fantasy is the jetpack, a small piece of equipment on your back which enables you to climb vertically into the air and fly forwards, backwards and turn. Eric Sort was a stuntman in Hollywood for about a decade and has strapped jet packs to his back more than 600 times and propelled himself hundreds of meters into the air. Now he works for an energy drink company that pays him to travel around the world with his jet pack. As Scott says I get to do what I love and wherever I go I advertise go fast drinks. Existing packs work for little more than 30 seconds, but people are working on designs which let you fly around for 20 minutes. That would be amazing, says Scott. Paramotoring is another way of getting into the air. It combines the sort of parachute used in paragliding with a small engine and propeller and is now becoming popular. Chris Clark has been flying a paramotor for five years. Getting about is roughly comparable with driving a petrol-powered car in terms of expense. The trouble is that paramotoring is ill-suited to commuting because of the impossibility of taking off in strong winds, says Clark. Another keen paramotorist recently experienced a close call when in the air. I started to get a warm feeling in my back, says Perrick Vandenbulk, I thought I was just sweating. But then I started to feel burning and I realized I had to get to the ground fast. After an inspection of the engine later, I noticed that the exhaust pipe had moved during the flight and the harness had started melting. This hasn't put Vandenbulk off, however, and he is enthusiastic about persuading others to take up paramotoring. However he warns, although it seems cheaper to try to teach yourself, you will regret it later as you won't have a good technique. A training course will cost over 1,000, while the equipment costs a few thousand pounds. You may pick up cheaper equipment secondhand, however. There was one pre-used kit advertised on a website, with a bit of damage to the cage and tips of the propellers due to a rough landing. Scared myself to death. The seller reported, hence the reason for this sake. Fun though it is, paramotoring is not in the same league as the acrobatics demonstrated by Eve Rosie. He has always enjoyed being a daredevil showman. He once parachuted from a plane above Lake Geneva and, intentionally skimming the top of a fountain as he landed, he descended to the lake where he grabbed some water ski equipment and scared water skiing while the crowd watched open-mouthed. Rossi, who has been labeled the Birdman, was born in 1959 in Switzerland. After flying planes for the Air Force from the age of 20 to 28, he went on to do a job as a pilot with a commercial airline from 1988 to 2000. The cockpit of a plane is the most beautiful office in the world, he says, but I didn't have any contact with the air around me. It was a bit like being in a box or a submarine underwater. From then on, he therefore concentrated on becoming the first jet-powered flying man. In May 2008, he stepped out of an aircraft at about 3,000 meters. Within seconds he was soaring and diving at over 290 km per hour, at one point reaching 300 km per hour, about 104 km per hour faster than the typical falling skydive. His speed was monitored by a plane flying alongside. Rossi started his flight with a free fall, then enabled him to float to the ground. The jet turbines are attached to special wings which he can unfold. The wings were manufactured by a German firm called JCT Composites. Initially he had approached a company called Jetkit which specialized in miniature planes, but the wings they made for him weren't rigid enough to support the weight of the engine. Rossi says he has become the first person to maintain a stable horizontal flight, thanks to aerodynamic carbon foldable wings. Without these special wings, it is doubtful he would have managed to do this. Rossi's ambitions include flying down the Grand Canyon. To do this, he will have to fit his wings with bigger, more powerful jets. The engines he currently uses already provide enough thrust to allow him to climb through the air, but then he needs the power to stay there. In terms of the physical strength involved, Rossi insists it's no more difficult than riding a motorbike. But even the slightest change in position can cause problems. 
I have to focus hard on relaxing in the air, because if you put tension in your body, you start to swing round. If he makes it, other flyers will want to know whether they too will someday be able to soar. The answer is yes, possibly, but it is unlikely to be more than an expensive hobby. Even in his 90s, the German mountaineer Anderl Heckmer was still a popular guest at climbing events around the world. He would sit with a twinkle in his eye as young climbers introduced themselves, eager to shake hands with the man who led the first ascent of the north face of the mountain called the Eiger. Heckmer had seen it all. His brilliant 1938 climb with three companions up the Eiger, notorious for its rock falls and sudden, violent storms, is still regarded as one of the greatest expressions of mountaineering skill in history. Reinhold Messner, perhaps the most celebrated living climber, thought the three-day ascent a work of art. Quite what Heckmer would have made of Danny Arnold is another question. In April 2011, Arnold climbed Heckmer's route in just 2 hours 28 minutes, a jaw-dropping record that stunned the alpine climbing scene. The scale of Arnold's effort, two years in the planning, is mind-boggling. The psychological pressure on such a gloomy mountain wall, passing landmarks such as Death Bivouac is obvious. A lot has changed since 1938, but the Eiger is still a dangerous place even for a roped climber. Yet, for speed, a mold climbed without anything to catch him if he fell. One loose handhold or falling stone and he would be dead, but he had to push such thoughts from his mind. I didn't even think for a moment about falling, he says. Apart from the danger, the athletic demands were huge. The North Face itself is a gigantic amphitheater, 1,600 meters in vertical height. Working every day as a guide in the mountains, the 27-year-old says he didn't need to do any special training. He had climbed the route several times, so knew its secrets. The real challenge was getting his head right for the intense concentration required. He turned back on a couple of earlier attempts because he didn't feel right. But Arnold Zeiger ascent wasn't the only mind-blowing speed ascent that year. A few months later in August, 22-year-old Andreas Steindl sprinted up the nearby Matterhorn in just 2 hours 5 minutes, starting at Zalhaus, on the outskirts of Zermatt in Switzerland. That's a vertical gain of 2,915 meters, and while the Matterhorn's Hornley Ridge, first climbed by Edward Wimper in 1865, is a much easier proposition than the Eiger's north face, the distance involved is much further. Most climbers attempting the Matterhorn take the cable car to Schwarzee, a pretty tam lake at a 2,500 meters much visited by hikers, and then walk a further two hours to the Hornley Mountain hut at the foot of the mountain. After a night there, they continue at around 3.30 a.m., with the climb itself taking most parties another six to eight hours. Steindl left Zermatt at 4.05 a.m., using running shoes and ski poles approaching the peak, before switching to boots and crampons. He was on the summit just after 7 a.m. Putting the mountain off limits to other members of the public wasn't an option, so Steindl had to overtake about 90 other climbers on his way to the top, not easy on a steep mountain that claims a dozen lives each year, although he said he was buoyed by their words of support. Arnold faced the same problem on the Eiger, passing 20 roped parties, including fellow guide Simon Anthematten and his client. Anthematten was the previous record holder on the Matterhorn. Arnold's most anxious moments came while passing some climbers at the end of the so-called Traverse of the Gods, which leads back into the center of the face, just before the final difficult section. Having all of those people on the route also had advantages, Arnold says. They'd made a good path and most of the holds were free of snow. The disadvantages of course were that I'd sometimes have to wait maybe one or two minutes to pass. That suggests it might be possible to go even faster, although Arnold says he has finished setting records on the Eiger. Despite his youth, Steindl is not just a fast climber but a top skier and trail runner too, reflecting the narrowing gap between mountaineering and mountain racing or sky running. Zermatt isn't just famous for the Matterhorn but hosts two of the most prestigious cross-country mountain races in the world, the legendary Patrawil de Glaciers, a high-altitude ski mountaineering event held in April, and July's Zermatt Marathon. One of the team that holds the record for the Patrawil's 53-kilometer course is Ferent Troilet, who, along with Anthematten, held the Matterhorn record until Steindl's effort this summer. Catalonian skier and ultra-running legend Killian Jornet, three-time winner of the Ultra Trail Mont Blanc race, has also shown an interest in speed ascents. He holds the record for the fastest ascent of Kilimanjaro, reaching the summit of Africa's highest peak in 5 hours 22 minutes in 2010. 
Jornet makes no secret of his admiration for the Italian mountain runner Bruno Brunid. In 1995, Brunid ran from Servinia, on the Italian side of the Matterhorn, to the summit and back in just 3 hours 14 minutes, a record that really has stood the test of time and one that Jornet would love to add to his tally. Are climbers in danger of turning the mountains into a racetrack? Climbers have always compared the speed of their ascents, says Uli Steck, who held the north face of the Eiger record until Arnold's climb. And though the speed and style of climbing has been transformed, the danger isn't much less than it was it was in Heckmere's day. The more you do it, says Steck, the more things can go wrong. English-speaking countries, speakers of two or more languages are in the minority. 84% of New Zealanders are monolingual, speakers of only one language. This leaves a small number who claim to speak two or more languages, a small percentage of whom were born in New Zealand. No matter how proud people are of their cultural roots, to speak anything other than English is a marker of difference here. That's why eight-year-old Tiffany Dvorak no longer wishes to speak her mother tongue, German, and eight-year-old Annie Powell is embarrassed when people comment on the fact that she is able to speak Maori. As Joanne Powell, Annie's mother, points out, in Europe, it's not unusual for kids to be bilingual. But, if you speak another language to your children in New Zealand, there are some people who think that are not helping them to become a member of society. But in fact, the general agreement among experts is that learning a second language is good for children. Experts believe that bilinguals people who speak two languages have a clear learning advantage over their monolingual schoolmates. This depends on how much of each language they can speak, not on which language is used, so it doesn't matter whether they are learning Maori or German or Chinese or any other language. Kathy Elder, a professor of language teaching and learning at Auckland University, says, a lot of studies have shown that children who speak more than one language sometimes learn one language more slowly, but in the end, they do as well as their monolingual schoolmates, and often better, in other subjects. The view is that there is an improvement in general intelligence from the effort of learning another language. Dr. Bridget Halford, a professor of linguistics at Freiburg University in Germany, agrees. Bilinguals tend to use language better as a whole. She says, They also display greater creativity and problem-solving ability, and they learn further languages more easily. So with all of the benefits, why do we not show more enthusiasm for learning other languages? Parents and teachers involved in bilingual education say pressure from friends at school, general attitudes to other languages in English-speaking countries, and problems in the school system are to blame. In New Zealand, Immigrants face the possibility of culture being lost along with the language their children no longer wish to speak. Tiffany's mother, Suzanne Dvorak, has experienced this. When she and husband Dieter left Germany six years ago to start up a new life in New Zealand, they thought it would be the perfect opportunity to raise their two-year-old as a bilingual. After all, bilingual Turkish families in Germany were normal and Suzanne had read all the books she could find on the subject. The idea was to have home as a German language environment and for Tiffany to learn English at Nisi school. But when Tiffany went to Nasi school she stopped talking completely. She was quiet for about two or three months. Then, when she took up talking again, it was only in English. Concerned for her language development, Dieter started speaking English to his daughter while Suzanne continued in German. Today, when Suzanne speaks to her daughter in German, she still answers in English or sometimes she speaks half and half. I checked with her teacher and she very seldom mixes up German and English at school. She speaks English like a New Zealander. It's her German that's behind, says Suzanne. Professor Halford, also a mother of two bilingual children, says, it's normal for kids to refuse to speak their home language at the stage when they start to socialize with other kids in kindergarten or school. But, she says, this depends a lot on the attitudes of the societies in question. In monolingual societies, like New Zealand, kids want to be like all the others and sometimes use bilingualism as one of the battlefields for finding their own identity in contrast to that of their parents. She supports Suzanne's approach of not pressuring her daughter. Never force the child to use a specific language, just keep using it yourself. The child will accept that.
There is often a time when children or teenagers will need to establish their own identity as different from their schoolmates and they may use their other language to do so. Kathy Elder thinks immigrant parents should only speak English to their children if they are able to use English well themselves. What parents should do is provide rich language experiences for their children in whatever language they speak well. They may feel like outsiders and want to speak the local language, but it is more important for the child's language development to provide a lot of language experience in any language. There can be differences between children in attitudes to learning languages. Suzanne Drack's two-year-old son, Danyan, is already showing signs of speaking German and English equally well. While her ideal scenario hasn't happened with Tiffany, she is aware that her daughter has a certain bilingual ability which, although mainly passive at this stage, may develop later on. Joanne Powell feels the same way about her daughter, Ani. At the moment she may not want to speak Maori, but that's okay because she'll pick it up again in her own time. It's more important that she has the ability to understand who she is. By learning another language, she can open the door to another culture. Donna Chan, 25, a marketing specialist for IBM, arrived here with her parents from Hong Kong when she was four. She also remembers refusing to speak Chinese when she started primary school. But now she appreciates she had the chance to be bilingual. It's quite beneficial speaking another language in my job. Last year, my company sent me to a trade fair in Hong Kong because I could speak Chinese. Being bilingual definitely opens doors, she says. Asterisk Maori, the language spoken by the Maori people, the first native people of New Zealand. Phases of the Moon Traveling a distance of approximately 382,400 kilometers, the moon takes just over 29 days to complete its orbit around the Earth. During this lunar cycle, many different phases of the moon are visible from Earth, even though the moon itself never changes shape. The cyclic period of the moon is determined by the extent to which the sun illuminates the moon on the side that is facing Earth. Just like Earth, the moon is sphere-shaped, and thus always half illuminated by the sun. However, because the moon and the Earth are in synchronous rotation, we can see only the near side of the moon. The side we do not see is called the far side, or the dark side, a term that is often misunderstood the dark side refers to the mysteriousness of this unseen side, not the amount of light it receives. Both the near and the far sides of the moon receive approximately the same amount of sunlight. Though we see a slightly different moon from Earth each day, its repetitive cycle is both predictable and functional. There are eight phases of the moon each with a unique name that signifies how much of the moon is visible from Earth. In the early phases, the moon is said to be waxing or gradually getting larger. The first phase is called new moon. In this phase, the moon is lined up between the earth and the sun. The illuminated side of the moon is facing the sun, not the earth, so from earth, there appears to be no moon at all. As the moon begins to move slowly eastward away from the sun, it becomes slightly more visible. After new moon, the waxing crescent phase begins. During this phase, the moon appears to be less than half illuminated. First quarter occurs when one half of the moon is visible. It is called first quarter, not because of its size, but because it represents the end of the first quarter of the moon cycle. The next phase ID called waxing gibbous and represents a moon that is larger than half a sphere, but not quite a whole. This phase is followed by full moon, which occurs when the moon's illuminated side is directly facing Earth. As the moon begins to get smaller again, it is said to be waning. The phases in the second half of the cycle appear the same as the first, except that the opposite half of the near side of the moon is illuminated, thus the moon appears to be shrinking rather than growing waning gibbous is followed by last quarter, when one half of the moon is visible, and finally waning crescent. In the northern hemisphere, when the moon is waxing, the light of the moon increases from right to left. The opposite occurs in the southern hemisphere. Like the sun, the moon is an accurate tool for measuring time. A complete cycle of the moon is called a lunation. A full cycle of the moon typically lasts just under one calendar month, therefore, the phase of the moon that starts a month usually repeats just before the month is through. When two full moons occur in one calendar month, the second one is called a blue moon. This phenomenon occurs about once every 2.7 years. Within one cycle, the moon's age is calculated from the last day of the new moon.
For example, the moon is approximately 15 days old during the full moon phase. The moon can also be used to calculate the time of day. Just like the sun, the moon rises and sets each day and is visible on the Earth's horizon. At new moon, the moon and sun rise and set at almost the same time, as the moon begins to wax or move farther in its orbit, it rises approximately one hour later each day. By full moon, the moon rises at about the same time the sun sets and set when the sun rises. Therefore, the moon is our in the daytime as often as it is at night even though it is not always as easy to see in the daylight. The Islamic calendar is based on the phases of the moon. The beginning of each new month in the Islamic calendar begins when the waxing crescent first appears in the night sky. The primary phases of the moon, which include new moon, first quarter, full moon, and last quarter are published in almanacs for each month. The phases can also be found on many calendars in the Western world. Despite the world's fascination with the moon, its phases are not entirely unique. The planets Venus and Mercury have similar phases, however, unlike the moon, these planets can never be on the opposite side of the Earth from the Sun. To see the equivalent of the full moon phase of these planets, we would need to have the capacity to see through the sun. Canoes around the world Many cultures throughout the world have developed some form of canoe, a long, slender, open boat powered by handheld paddles. In each case, the technologies and materials used to construct the canoe reflect the resources available to that particular culture. There are three types of canoe, the frame and bark canoe, the dugout, and the plank canoe. Developed by cultures on every continent since prehistoric times, canoes continue to be used today both for survival and for recreation. The birch bark canoe, an example of the frame and bark type of construction, was developed in the region that is now the northeastern United States and eastern Canada. Native Americans constructed birch bark canoes by building a frame from spruce wood and then using roots to stitch pieces of birch bark over the frame. In areas where birch was not available, bark from elm or spruce trees was used instead. After the bark was sewn to the frame, the canoes were then sealed with a mixture of spruce gum and bare grease. These substances worked very well to make the boat watertight. Birch bark canoes were lightweight and thus easily portaged around waterfalls or from lake to lake. Most were designed to hold no more than two or three people and were used for lake and river travel. When Europeans opened up the fur trade in North America in the 17th century, the French traders used larger versions, 30 to 40 feet in length, to transport furs in large quantities across the Great Lakes for shipment back to Europe. The dugout, a canoe created from a single tree trunk, has been used in many areas throughout the world. Simple versions of hollowed-out logs were used by native peoples throughout much of North America. Coastal groups such as the Haida and Tlingit in the Pacific Northwest developed large dugout crafts 60 feet or long that could carry large numbers of people on the ocean for trade, warfare, fishing, whaling, and travel to ceremonial gatherings. First, the outer and inner bark around the entire circumference of a tall, straight tree, often a cedar or redwood, was removed. This process, called girdling, cuts off the flow of sap, thus killing the tree and making it easier to chop down. Then the tree was felled and cut to the appropriate length. The opening of the dugout was created by repeatedly burning the wood, then carving it out with tools. In early times, stone tools were used, but later metal tools came into use. Once the canoe was carved out, the boat builders filled it with water and brought the water to a boil using stones heated on a fire. This softened the wood and the weight of the water caused the walls of the canoe to bow outward, giving it more width than the original girth of the tree. The ocean-going Chumash people of what is now Southern California developed the tomal, or plank canoe. They created their canoes by cutting planks from redwood trees, carving and shaping them into a canoe without any frame. They lashed the planks together by drilling holes and tying them with cords. Pitch from pine trees and tar, also found locally, were used between the planks and over the entire hull for waterproofing. The canoe played a major role in the spread of all the Pacific Island cultures. These cultures developed outrigger and double-hulled dugout canoes. Outriggers have one or more parallel floats attached to a dugout canoe with poles for increased stability in ocean waves. Double-hulled canoes have a platform between two parallel dugouts. These highly stable designs, combined with sails, enabled the Polynesians to go on epic ocean journeys and to inhabit far-flung islands. Several families, 
or as man as 200 people in the largest vessels, could sail in each of these double-hulled canoes with food, water, and domesticated plants and animals across huge expanses of ocean, and in this way the Polynesian people spread throughout the Pacific, establishing new communities on previously uninhabited islands. In areas of dense rainforest throughout the world, including the Amazon basin, and parts of Africa and Asia, river travel with dugouts was, and in many cases still is, the primary means of transportation. In West Africa, large war canoes capable of transporting many fighters were carved from single trees. Descendants of the ancient canoes are still widely used today. Traditional cultures around the world still use dugout canoes for fishing and transportation. Today's modern recreational canoes, while now often constructed with aluminum, fiberglass, wood, and canvas, plastic, and other synthetic materials, still retain the shape and basic design of the birch bark canoes developed in the distant past. The catamaran sailboat, widely used in racing, is a direct descendant of the double-hulled sailing canoe used thousands of years ago by the Polynesian cultures.